first of all, uh, welcome uh, the three of you. Uh, thank you so much for participating today on today's session of uh, this debate that we're going to have uh, hosted by the International Research Group on Authoritarianism and Counter Strategies, the IRGAC of the Halls of Luxembourg Foundation. Uh, we're going to be talking about things related to the climate crisis, to food sovereignty and populism, all under the context of the COVID-19 pandemic in the global south. Uh, before we start with the interview itself, I, I would like to introduce uh, the fellows that we have here today. Uh, the three fellows are all part of the research group that I mentioned, the IRGAC. And uh, I wanted to kick off with uh, Sabrina Fernandes. Uh, she has a sociology PhD from Carleton University and is currently a senior research fellow at the Institute for Politik uh, Wissenschaft at the University of Vienna uh, as a part of a postdoctoral fellowship uh, with the RGAC and the University of Brasilia. Thanks, Sabrina, for making it here. Uh, then we have uh, Bovindra Mungjani. Uh, he holds a PhD on post-colonialisms and global citizenship from the University of Coimbra. Uh, he is based at the Institute for Poverty, Land and Agrarian Studies at the University of Western Cape as a postdoctoral researcher who is also a part of the RGC project. Finally, we have uh, Sakir Noir here. He also has a sociology PhD from the Paris Nantia University. Uh, he will soon become a visiting research fellow uh, at the Center for Middle Eastern and North African Studies at the Fire University of Berlin as a part of the IRGC MENA research cluster. And uh, yeah, lastly, there's me. Uh, my name is Pedro Magalhães. Uh, I am a master's student at the Institute of uh, Development Research and Development Policy at the University of Bochum. And I'm currently working with the Hose Luxembourg Foundation, providing assistance specifically to the IRGAC. Uh, so once again, thanks to three of you for coming. Uh, I think that we're gonna have a very interesting debate. And um, so we're going to separate the interview in two sessions. The first session uh, will consist of four questions dedicated to all three fellows here present. And the second session will be dedicated to individual questions to each of the fellows. Uh, without further ado, um, I'd like to kick off uh, with the first question. So uh, worldwide, the COVID-19 crisis has demonstrated the insufficiencies of current food systems in providing food security for marginalized populations. On your perspectives, uh, how has the pandemic impacted the provisioning of food in your countries of origin and or the countries that are included on your research? I would like to start off with Boa, please, uh, if you could start off answering. I think that, um... Well, the COVID crisis uh, only um, shown the, has shown the um, contradictions and uh, the inequalities that uh, uh, existed you know, for a long time. It has exposed them more now, uh, but uh, I don't think that it was the COVID itself that brought the food crisis and, um, you know, it was, the food systems that are in place are unable to um, provide people with, uh, you know, enough nutritious, healthy food, and the food uh, system systems and regime is controlled. You know, is 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 is, is corporate driven. I'll give you an example of South Africa, where uh, in industrial agriculture is more dominant, and you know, small scale. I mean, in poor neighborhoods. Um, had uh, other um, ways of, you know, getting food because not always they could afford uh, to go to the store and buy food. When COVID came and the South African government imposed uh, restrictions, uh, the whole of the informal uh, sector was, was kind of criminalized. So they could not go out, they could not go to the street. And those people uh, went hungry because because you know they could not they could not uh, access food uh, alternatively as as they will they will do in normal circumstances and they couldn't buy in shop rides pick and pay and, and other uh, food retailers so I think the COVID just exposed and in some way in some cases in, intensified the crisis that this is is a long a long standing crisis. 
We thank you both for the input. Um, I would like to move on to Sabrina, please. Um, in the case of Brazil, one of the things that uh, made it all worse is because during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we are under the government of Bolsonaro, and for uh, since before the pandemic, it was quite clear that the stocks of grains, for example, of the government, they were running low, and the government was not doing anything to actually curb the situation. So prices of certain certain uh, foods they were already rising before the pandemic. Now with the pandemic, because uh, joblessness is on the rise. Uh, it's one of the all-time highs right now. And because most of the jobs uh, that are turning up, they're still very informal jobs, things are very uncertain for a lot of people. So we're having, we're in the situation of large food insecurity. Uh, there are estimates that put uh, about half of the Brazilian population under food insecurity right now, and about 19 million people actually going hungry. So um, this is a very uh, different situation from uh, when we were at the end of the Lula government and he had gone through the zero hunger program. So this is something that is lacking. A lot of the, um, the solidarity that's coming in relation to this comes from social movements. So for example, the landless, landless workers movement, the homeless workers movement, the Mutirão do Bem Viver, there are different movements that are engaging, uh, even Coalizão Negra por Direitos, who are trying to make sure that people at least get fed but this situation is a lot more structural. So uh, unless there's actually some level of like price regulation at, at the time, which is hard to see happening under Bolsonaro because of his dealing dealings with agribusiness or at least proper emergency income uh, that has actually been reduced and can barely pay for the most basic foods, uh, we think that the situation is still going to be uh, a problem even after the pandemic. Thank you for that. Um, Sakira, would you like to answer as well? Yeah, I, I'd like to add that in the in, 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 in the Arab region, in general, the economic uh, slowdown or shutdown, it's, uh, it's different from country to another. There is a lot of economic impact, especially the remittances, for example, for the workers in, in Gulf countries, in, in, in other poor uh, Arab countries are shut down. There is a lot of uh, uh, problems related to, for example, many countries in, in, in the Arab region don't have a social protection and unemployment insurance. And we have a big part of the population work in the informal sector. And with incapacity to go to search for work and uh, the bad social protection system, we, we have an increasing of the total number of poverty. For example, the ESCOA said that uh, there is more than 8 million person, 8 million people uh, failing into poverty in the Arab countries during this period. We add to this that the global context of the region, and I mean exactly the question of uh, the refugee, internal refugee, Syrian refugee in Lebanon, Palestinian in Syria, uh, Syrian in all other countries. We, we talk about about 66, uh, 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 about 50 million uh, refugee, Arab refugee in the Arab countries. And the region is one of the more food dependence all over the world. Uh, in, 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 in the region, we have 50% of the dairy calorie come from exportation. So this is the, this is the, the large image. If, if we talk specifically about Egypt, uh, in Egypt, we have two different uh, problems linked to COVID. The first thing, there is an increase in exportation. We export more orange and uh, strawberries because the European countries open the access to, to Egypt uh, exportation. And we have the crisis of the, the, the capacity to buy uh, food, for, uh, foods actually for, for the informal sector, as I was said, and the small farmers who are have less insurance so we have hungry for local and incapacity of farmer to, to sell their product. And for the 
exporter, they continue to export the specific uh, specific uh, product to the European market and also for the Gulf country market that are open to exportation. So we have more benefit for the agribusiness and less for the farmers and a general uh, crisis uh, nutrition situation, if, we, if you can say that. Okay. Well, thank you a bunch for this. Uh, this is very enlightening. I think we're going to move on uh, to the second question, which is also tied in uh, to the discussion of food security and food sovereignty. And uh, with that said, I'd like to ask, uh, under the light of the increase in hunger associated with the COVID-19 pandemic, in which ways is food sovereignty being discussed in your country? Who are the main actors uh, who are mobilizing the cause and what are their strategies? Uh, considering that we began with Bo, I think that now we can begin with Sabrina, please. Okay, so uh, the conversation around food sovereignty is actually not that old in Brazil for a long time, uh, basically uh, through the influence of international organizations, people were still discussing food security as a measure, um, but uh, with the landless workers movement, the Via Campesina movement, so coming from the Campesino uh, sector, the conversation started shifting towards food sovereignty, towards uh, including into, into this not only access to the basic amount of calories, but good quality food that's grown without, without agrochemicals, uh, that is gone, grown in a sustainable way. So uh, in the past decade, it has become a lot stronger. And uh, throughout the, the pandemic, uh, it has come into conversation, particularly through these solidarity campaigns that they've been quite active on. So like there are parts of the country where, for example, the MST donated tons of like of grains. So for example, rice or beans and things like that, considering that the MST is going through ongoing criminalization at the same time. So it's showing solidarity and showing people that the social movements are actually with them when the government is against all of them. Um, so something else that I think uh, has become quite clear is the separation between charity, like everyday charity, charity that might come from the upper classes and actual social movement based building work that involves food. Because um, during the pandemic, we even had cases of of like, uh, like upper class people donating food, but it was always like uh, something very punctual. They would go there, they would donate some food and they do uh, perhaps a food drive. And then they would just kind of leave those communities there. When it's a social movement engaging with this, they try to build a relationship with the community and see what the other needs in the communities are. That's the reason why, for example, um, the homeless workers movement is now developing these community kitchens uh, in certain neighborhoods because they can be a way for people to access food for free, but also they can access resources, they can know more people there, they can ask for help. So it's a way of making sure they're present in the communities as well. Uh, there are other plans coming from other organizations in the left uh, to create more like um, collective territories to help out with this. And this is a way to make sure that if there's no proper public policy coming uh, in the near future to help with the hunger issue, the community, the com communities themselves, they'll become more resilient. They'll start growing their own community gardens. Uh, they'll start learning about how not to waste food and, uh, and then perhaps even increase these uh, bridges of solidar uh, solidaristic economy. Uh, between the small growers and the people who are purchasing in the cities and the small towns. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, now, Boa, would you like to answer? Oh, no, sorry, Sakira, would you like to answer, please? Okay. Uh, actually, in, 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 uh, in, in the Arab countries, the, the COVID, not only the COVID, but also the economic crisis are uh, led to more discussion about food issue in general, but food security in a specific. And uh, uh, for example, there is a, a many local initiative uh, to uh, support local food systems, to, to uh, encourage people to rethinking their way of, uh, of, con or of relations with market. There's many local markets and farmers markets were, were initiated, for example, in Lebanon, uh, after the after the economic crisis and during the COVID, there is 
have a huge dynamics around local food system and uh, search and uh, direct contact with farmers and for and there is another example for this dynamic uh, link it to the 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 creation of north african food sovereignty networks to expand the relation between uh, uh, between uh, morocco tunisia algeria and egypt and uh, uh, try to to tie between small farmers and at, at the regional level in egypt we have something very interesting that the the, the, the actual constitution have an article about food sovereignty, but it's still very delinked with with the state policy and what's going uh, actually uh, with the politi policy which is focused on on uh, exportation led agriculture and, and and so on. But in in the intellectual and in the intellectual level, there is a lot of articles and public debate around food sovereignty. Uh, very recently, uh, take 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 a, a very interesting space in in, in in the public debate. Thank you very much, uh, Boa. Would you like to answer as well, please? Yes, uh, the conversation around food sovereignty in Mozambique uh, was introduced uh, around mid mid two thousand, especially when uh, the Mozambican Peasants Union hosted an international conference of Falavia Campesina um, in, in 2008. Um, and uh, slowly the, the conversation has been expanded to other uh, sectors of, of society within you know, the broader civil society, but also slowly um, in academic spaces, but uh, government and other um, you know, conventional NGOs prefer to stick with the concept of food security about which uh, Sabrina also mentioned. So in official parlance, uh, the, the, the dominant uh, concept is food um, security because I have the sense that uh, I have the feeling that uh, for the government um, saying food sovereignty is, a, is, is just a matter of semantics. I don't think they understand enough what we have, uh, we are saying about it and what movements, uh, you know, food justice movements say about food sovereignty. Um, but, uh, you know, I think there is a, also even in a, in a small pace, there is a, there is a growing uh, concern about the limitations of uh, the concept of food security uh, and people are talking more about, you know, uh, where the, the, does the food come from, who produces the food, who controls um, the markets and all of these things. Um, in South Africa, which is, you know, a highly um, commodified, you know, has a highly commodified uh, food systems, uh, movements are, are starting to also push for the concept of food sovereignty, um, which um, of course it has, uh, it has uh, it, its resistance, you know, uh, from counter forces. But the, there are two movements in, in South Africa where that uh, um, one of them actually, uh, it's, it's, it's a movement, it's an agrarian movement that I, I study. I mean, um, it's part of my uh, research, which is the food sovereignty campaign, right? In fact, it's the right uh, to land reform for food sovereignty campaign. Uh, and that is pushed uh, by mostly, you know, farm workers uh, uh, movements and, and 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 associations, because landlessness in South Africa is big. And there's another um, uh, movement that emerged, uh, mo mostly composed by academics and uh, you know, urban bin NGOs. That al is also called food sovereignty campaign. So there is there is you know, in in the society, there is a concern that the current food system and regime in South Africa is it's unable to cater or to it's unable to solve uh, the issues of 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 hunger um, and also it's 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 um, it's actually now 
you know, it's all actually included within the issues of, you know, uh, climate justice and ecology, right? It's not only about access to food for people to eat, it's about how does this food is produced and the extent to which, you know, chemicals and fertilizers and other harmful inputs are used. So I think it was still very uh, behind Brazil and Latin America in the discussion of the, the, the concept. But there is a growing uh, movement uh, that is challenging the conventional ways of seeing food regimes and, and systems. Very interesting. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, so now that we got ourselves uh, started, <laughs> now that we have got the discussion, uh, I'd like to move on to maybe a bit more of a tricky question. Um, uh, so. As perceived by the experiences of authoritarian populist governments in your countries of origin, uh, there are diverging stances on climate change amongst authoritarian regimes, uh, ranging from complete climate denialism uh, to equal fascism to defenders of a form of green capitalism. In which ways is the matter of climate and sustainability approached in both the ecological politics and the ecological discourses from the actors of the right or the authoritarian right uh, in your countries of origin and uh, in your countries uh, included on your research? Uh, I think that we can start off with Sakir, maybe. Okay. Uh, at, at, the, at the discursive level in Egypt, uh... We talk a lot about uh, preparing for green. I mean, it's kind of we we support all kind of greening and ecological policy. But this is actually in the discourse level. But in the practice, how the when we go more on depth and see what exactly the state do, we we have we can we can distinguish between two kind of of, uh, of real action. The first one is more or less can be shaped as a kind of denial because, for, and I talk about the, the, the development of, uh, of uh, real estate project in a coastal dune uh, in Egypt and this type of uh, mass tourism activity around the Red Sea. And in this old project, we see a total neglection to, for example, the impact of the climate change on, on, on sea levels and how the erosion of, uh, of the coastal zone, the marine life and how it's very important to the biodiversity and all these issues are totally even neglected or totally denied. We don't, we don't, even we don't talk about this or we say, no, no, it's, it's, an, it's a kind of exaggeration and the, the, the Delta will not, the 13% of the Delta will not disappear that as some scientific research say actually within 50 years, we may lose 13% of the Nile Delta because of climate change, all this are totally neglected in the world. And the other side, we have a kind of green capitalism. And the, the, the project of, uh, of Ben Ban, which is a huge uh, solar farm. One, I, I think it's the biggest solar farm in Africa. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a kind of partnership between, uh, partnership between the state and uh, uh, and European Bank and many uh, many international investors and the local community are taught because it's it's not very far from from my 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 village actually and the people are totally excluded from all this dynamic and and they produce energy for uh, for uh, for linking to other can it's, it's a type of exportation of energy actually and the, the local community are not at all engaged so we have many types of uh, of ecological policy and they are not totally in one uh, category okay thank you very much uh bo would you like to go on oh yes uh, i will respond to your uh, my response to your question is probably um uh, I mean, I will divert a bit from your question, <laughs> if I'm allowed. Um, 
we, you know, in Mozambique, we do not have what I can call climate change denialism. In fact, we have been uh, victims of, uh, you know, ma two major cyclones and uh, we are recurrently having floods or, or droughts. So Mozambique is, is one of the most uh, affected countries by climate change and, you know, both the society, the states, and academia know that we are that climate change is real what where the connection is not uh, made is is on the causes of it for instance when we had um the idai cyclone in in the Beira uh, city uh in central mozambique um so it was like it was put as if it's like a, the natural forces. So nobody is behind that, you know. So the discussion was not who, who causes that, well, you know, we are victim of, a, of, a, of a, a global system of, you know, extractivism of, um, uh, you know, that, that is causing this. I think that discussion was not, was not uh, present. And I think the, 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 the that, uh, you know, Denialism, I see, it's not uh, on rhetoric or on discourse; it's on practice. Because at the same time as my state, my state knows, or my government knows, that we are very vulnerable, vulnerable to climate um, events. At the same time, the kind of developments they are putting in place, which is highly extractivism, you know, extracting coal, giving gas concessions to multinationals, pushing for uh, highly mecha me mechanized and industrialized agricultural models um, is is actually a, a counterproductive action for a country that is already suffering from climate change. So I think that the connection is not entirely made in in, in Mozambique. So there is no a verbal uh, discursive denialism like, for instance, uh, Bolsonaro has in, in in Brazil, but the actions are deeply contradictory. And I think it's, it's that connection that is lacking that I think, uh, you know, you know, climate justice movements uh, should, 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 should make. But there is an incredible work that is done by a few, uh, I have to say, few, but very um, militant and, and progressive movements. Uh, one of them is connected, which is called Justice Ambiental, Environmental Justice, is, is connected to the, um, you know, uh, Friends of the Earth International, which is a transnational articulation of, of uh, climate, climate justice and environmental, in, in environmental organizations. Great, thanks so much, Boa. Uh, now, Sabrina, please. Yes. So Brazilian is a particular complicated situation because the Bolsonaro government is very uh, um, forward about being uh, a denialist of climate change. Uh, this was very much influenced by how Bolsonaro got elected, playing off the Trump campaign, paying, uh, paying off a lot of the Trump moves against the environment. So when uh, Trump uh, got out of the Paris Accord, Bolsonaro is like, yes, let's do the same. But at the same time, even now that Trump is uh, gone from the presidency, Bolsonaro is still going very, very much forward with this because it's also part of the way that he's developed the, the internal dynamics of the government. So the, the Ministry of the Environment is almost a Ministry of Anti-Environment in the sense uh, it makes it easier for the Ministry of Agriculture, which is almost Ministry of Agribusiness, to go forward and press on and do other things. So um, it, it, the, the point is to make sure they extract the most resources as possible, and they're also privatizing a lot. So at the same, uh, they cut the budget for fighting climate change um, by 95%. As soon as um, they got into power, they cut the budget for fighting forest fires. So the attacks on the environment, they're actually daily in Brazil. And they're also making it harder for uh, some of the government entities. So for example, Obama to actually go and try to reinforce the laws. Now, this has led to a situation where uh, environmentalists are fearing for their lives together of in with indigenous communities. Um, the, in the, uh, there are a lot of murders of indigenous leaders in the country right now. And we do have a feeling that um, the, the particular policies coming from Bolsonaro is about going to, perhaps to COP at the UN 
and saying that yes, we're worried about this, but actually not doing anything. So they sometimes they just want to save face in front of the other governments, but it's not actually part of the project. Something that's worrisome is that um, the Joe Biden uh, has entered into a closed door agreement with Bolsonaro uh, talking about Amazon conservation. Well, we know that if these funds are actually transferred, this, this is not going to go towards conservation. This is going to go towards mega projects in the Amazon, in the Amazon region. So whenever climate change actually arises as something that uh, Brazil should be worried about, and that they should change their policies around it, then it's climate denialism. But when it comes about getting money, they will pretend to worry a little bit about this, should be able to access these funds. But uh, the good news is that uh, there are surveys that come out from time to time that say that Brazilian people do worry worry about climate change. So it's more of a matter of making sure that our representatives can actually put this at the center of the conversation. So we could be talking about this more and more and people, people will be compelled to push for more change. There are actors in the country right now talking about what a Brazilian Green New Deal would look like. Uh, well, most, most and anything, it will have to be an anti-imperialist Green New Deal. It would have to consider the particularities of Latin America, and uh, the resource grabs that happen, uh, that come from, yes, the US, that come from um, Canada, Europe, but even China. So all of these things need to uh, be taken into consideration, but it's part of an ongoing conversation between indigenous associations, Quilombola associations, uh, the large campaign Sino, uh, social movements, researchers right to the city movement. So it's more of a matter of making sure that we can articulate this uh, because the interest is there. We just need to work on it. Wonderful, thank you very much. So moving on to the final question of this first session, uh, I'd like to ask all three of your fellows here. Um, so in your research, uh, you have highlighted the importance of searching for responses for the climate crisis from actors who are located within the margins of society, both in their national and in their international contexts. Why do you all think that this is of particular importance in reconstructing uh, sustainable alternatives for a post-COVID world? Yeah. Uh, can you, can you elaborate your question a bit more. Um, but... Yeah, so the idea here is that from what I've saw from looking for your work is that there's a lot of uh, importance attributed to marginality. So uh, living within the margins of society. You know? So we're looking for answers, not uh, specifically in the actors that we would, we would traditionally look for answers, no? uh, established social movements or established political parties, uh, but um, yeah, uh, actors who are um, yeah, living uh, from afar, who are not considered uh, in, in usual researches. Is that understood? Yes, what about those people? Why do you think this is of particular importance, looking to them for the construction of sustainable well, alternatives for a post-COVID yeah. world? Uh, I, I, my experience has always been like working with organized civil society. Um, and I will be frank, I, I have no experience or connection to sectors that, uh, as you said, are marginalized or are marginal, uh, which is a concept uh, that's not always um, accurate. No? Um, but I think, you know, starting from the principle that everybody should be, every citizen should be um, considered in, in this, in, in, you know, public policy discussions or in, you know, you know, if you look at democratic uh, uh, principles, they should not be at first place marginalized people, right? Um, but I mean, I think everyone should be should have an opportunity to participate in in in, in these kind of uh, discussions and uh, participate in the in the finding of solutions. I wouldn't know or what kind of uh, solutions these people will have because I mean, as I said, I'm, I've no. But you know, in principle, I, I think everyone should have an opportunity to participate in discussions beyond the climate change and beyond. Uh, um, for the sake of, of you know, exercising democracy. Um, 
by those who are uh, not participating in these discussions, um, it's, it's probably because they're also pushed out by other mechanisms such as access to education or access to housing. For instance, it's very difficult to organize people that are away from places where transport can reach. Um, so I think it's not, um, it's, 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 um, it's, 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 your question is deeper than what you're asking, <laughs> I would say. Uh, it, it, it touches, um, you know, sec, you know, issues of, you know, to what, to the, extent, the extent to which our societies are able to, um, you know, our states and, and, and the public service that our states are supposed to provide to the citizen um are able to reach everywhere everyone and not leave anybody behind <laughs> just using the 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 un uh, fao language here yeah. but uh yeah I, I think i think i will say i will say so but listen the civil society organizations i work with in mozambique specifically but also in south africa um they also articulate people that could be considered you know at the margins of of the society because you know in Mozambique it's mostly the peasantry which are, are, are far from from the you know urban centers are far from um, most of them do not receive um, basic public services um, and but they have, they have a platform which is the Mozambican Peasants Union I'm not claiming that uh, the Mozambican Peasants Union you know, represents every every rural inhabitant and, and every small scale farmer. But at least there is that platform platform that offers uh, its constituency to discuss issues related to to the climate change. And and UNAC, um, in this regard, is doing a great job of um, you know promoting the debate around uh, agroecology, sustainable uh, food production systems, food sovereignty, and so on and so forth. Great, thank you, Bo. I, I would love to, to give the word to Sabrina because that's where I got the, the term from, from the margins. And I think that she'll be able to uh, explain a bit better of what I actually meant. Mm -hmm. So Sabrina, please. Yeah, so I've been working with this uh, idea that uh, the kind of radical change that we need right now is only ever going to happen if we have large mobilization coming from the masses at the margins of capitalism. Because um, there's a tendency uh, there's a tendency for these mobiliza mobilizations that ha happen, for example, in Europe or in the US to become very domestic centered. So yes, we're gonna deal with climate change. So like look at the proposal <coughs> for the Green New Deal. And uh, it's a proposal very much focused on things that they're going to do internally, forgetting about how their foreign policy, their, their commercial, international uh, commercial interests actually affect all of this. Because the people at the margins other words, there's always affected by what's happening in other countries, in other regions, it's much easier for us to see this interconnectedness. Uh, so there's an appeal to this. Uh, the difficulty, however, is that uh, we're also dealing with a lot of different things at the same time. So the challenges are bigger. Uh, it's so much that for some people who may be interested in the topic of climate change and maybe worried about it, that yes, yes, but we still have a little bit of time on that, right? People are hungry today, so we need to focus on this one thing. So one of the main challenges is to make sure that we connect these things. So for example, you build a whole situation there. If you're fighting agribusiness, you're also uh, making sure that more people have access to water. And then you make sure that water doesn't become a commodity as is the interest of Kamala Harris, right? And it's a process as already been you know, going with, um, with um, uh, World Water Forum, right? And then you make sure that you're talking about like growing good food. So this relates to food sovereignty. So this also relates to uh, people having a different relationship to healthcare. You know, to, to, oh, this is more nutritious. This is what I should eat. This, this could connect to people in the animal liberation movement. So building these bridges about these different topics that, you know, they come across us uh, all of the time is easier, easier for us to understand that, well, the matter of climate change is, um, is uh, it overarching. It affects all of this. It affects all of these dynamics. 
So the power here, and actually the potency here, is to ensure that the people at the margins can actually articulate this property. So this calls for larger alliances, but not in the sense of just grabbing a social movement and a party and wow, well, they're together and they're doing a campaign, but connecting the dots to other people and connecting the dots to the people who are even further marginalized, as Boa uh, mentioned, in the sense that they are not organized. So they are worried, but they don't know where to go to. They don't know like where, what, what is the direction here. So um, to do this from the margins, organization is a main, a main uh, target. That has to be uh, part of the goal, especially because it's not like we're not going to cut it just with ad campaigns and posters and you know little you know things everywhere talking about how important this is. If people don't internalize this whole situation, right? So we should, we should actually be doing a lot more organizing work in making sure, yes, we're fighting climate change. Uh, so if we're talking about climate justice, we're also talking about your access to food. We're also talking about how we don't, how we want you to have proper sanitation, access to water and sanitation in the, in the favela or something like this. So this brings it closer to the people. Bringing closer to the people is easier for, for people to light up sparks when certain attacks happen. So uh, it's, not, it's not easy, uh, but it's definitely uh, a lot more, it definitely has a lot more potential than projects that are merely institutional coming from parliamentarians and dealing only with legislation that's going to come from the top. Wonderful. Thanks a bunch, Sabrina. Uh, Saka, would you like to go on? Yeah, I build from what Sabrina said that any any uh, acceptable uh, alternative have to build from bottom to up, not from up to down. So, uh, and this this is actually what I'm doing during my research on, for example, on, on, on poverty issue. And when I started poverty in rural Egypt, and I tried to, to test, to examine how uh, the application of World Bank concept of poverty is totally delinked to the reality and to the people's strategy to uh, facing poverty or to, to, to find a solution to their, right, to the, to their life. So uh, any, any, research or any uh, real uh, building of alternative have to start with this base, what's going on on the ground, how people act, how they cooperate, how they create their uh, livelihoods. And from this, we can start to think about this. And, and actually, focus, and actually, we, we can we can also discuss the idea of margin because this margin is very huge. It's about 80, 88% of the of the world population. It's not a really a margin because the, the majority of people are in the in the global south, the, the, the in the in the in the are poor or uh, near poor. So, so this is a huge number of population and we have take on consideration their, their choices, their strategies uh, within our, our, uh, our building for, for, for a solution. So this is what I'm, I'm going to say. Very nice. OK. Uh, thanks for the three of you for responding to this first I, session. I, I did not know that um, um, the question was about you know the margins of the capitalist system or the margins of <laughs> you want to go back to it or if you want no no it's fine it's fine yeah because, because you do have uh, peripheries and and centers even in the periphery of the of the capital system so i think the analysis is, is yeah is yeah i think um, your answer worked well for that part sorry i think your answer worked well to to talk about these internal dynamics Okay. Okay, good. Uh, so now I think uh, that we can move on to the second part uh, of our, our session today, our debate session today, uh, where I'll be dedicating uh, individual questions to each one of the fellows that are here present. And um, let's start off with Boaventura. Uh, 
once again. And um, I would like to ask you, in your previous work describing the action of the C19's People Coalition of South Africa, you mentioned that the momentum generated by the COVID-19 crisis may open up spaces for the birth of alternatives to agrarian capitalism. Why would you argue that the pandemic has created a space for change in rural landscapes in South Africa? And do you see the same movement happening in other countries uh, that compose Southern Africa? Yes, that argument was uh, based on um, actually empirical um, events we have seen in the whole of Southern Africa, an emergence of uh, movements, some of them uh, pre-existent that were, were activate, reactivated or activated, others that emerged as, 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 as a result of the, of the COVID shock, right? So in crisis uh, and almost you know, globally in crisis um, could allow new things to be born. And what I was saying is that since uh, the areas um, in which COVID, uh, you know, uh, hit uh, more uh, hardly in South Africa was, was the food system that was exposed, right? Um, and, um, you know, food justice movements were, were starting to think, what, what can we do? And in fact, there were, you know, networks and, and, and um, alliances that, that were forged at the time, at the moment in April, March, April, 2020, last year, right, 2020. And um, my, my, my little criticism there was that, okay, we should not continue to push for the same kind of things. We need to radicalize our demands because the moment is very, uh, radical itself in the in a bad in a bad sense like you know the 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 the, the COVID shock and the COVID crisis has uh, actually uh, you know um, it hits the you know the, the the oppressed in a way that uh, um, you know uh, yeah so I was saying this is an opportunity for movements for food justice movements to radicalize their demands and show. The, in fact, they didn't have to show the reality. I mean, the reality was evident. Everyone knew that, you know, um, the, the food system in South Africa was not able to um, respond well in moments where people, for instance, has to stay home to, to, to you know, there's to, people have to stay home. And, you know, like the, it, was, it, was, it was an exposure that uh, in my view, uh, could facilitate the emergence of some on something on, of something new, and 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 that movement actually um, did some interesting thing. For instance, they uh, managed to have meetings with the minister of, of uh, uh, rural development. That's, I think it's how it's called in South Africa uh, to uh, push for uh, radical land redistribution in South Africa, which is an issue, right? The colonial legacy or historical legacy of apartheid. Uh, where people have no land to, to grow their own food. So they were saying, look, we need a radical land redistribution. Uh, we need support, financial support to small scale farmers. We need um, the state to, re to rethink how uh, we actually uh, build our own food sovereignty in, in South Africa and so on and so, so forth. And similar kind of movements also emerged in, in, you know, in Zimbabwe, in Mozambique, um, and one, one thing that was very interesting here, it, it was the, you know, um, ar articulation of, uh, of, of movements and groups that, are, 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 you know, deal with different kind of things like, you know, intersectorial alliances that were born. So that was, was actually, a, it was an argument, but also a call for popular movements to radicalize demands and uh, stop, you know, asking for for um, little things and ask for, you know, um, a greater change of systems. That's what I, I, I intended to say in the article. Very, very interesting, Bowen. Thank you very much. Um, now we're going to move on to Sakir. Um, so Sakir, uh, when discussing the participation of smallholder farmers in the 2011 Egyptian revolution, you have argued that environmental concerns are growingly present in the framework of rural social movements in the country. 
under the pandemic, how has this affected the strategies of these movements with regards to climate change, uh, so sovereignty, et cetera? Uh, yes, in, in my in my uh, work on farmers and the revolution, that my, my, my central idea was to rethinking what's happening in Egypt within a more long durée frame. We, we, actually, the the inter international commenters and also the media and all these focused on a specific moment and specific place, which is Plas Tahrir. We all respect that, all these, but they didn't go more in depth in a in a historical uh, analysis uh, about what's happened during the long period and how farmers struggle against the new liberal uh, reform or impact the the lead, even the leader of uh, of uh, of the Egyptian revolution. So this this is very interesting to to have more. Uh, a long durée analysis to understand the process, not the moment of uh, what we are uh, living now. And this is actually can be applied to to the the, the impact of uh, COVID and its its relation to social movement. And this is also what I'm trying to do here in this uh, fellowship to study what 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 we had. What the, the, to study the environmentalism of the poor and how small farmers and local population in Upper Egypt had their way of um, of uh, struggling for the for the water, land, and right to a more uh, more uh, more uh, e e more equal right to land, water, and all. Uh, uh, ecological uh, more uh, more justice uh, more environmental justice and this is my my project act so I, I have less element to develop now but I, I, I I'm working on this wonderful no problem it's uh, good to know that there's a project for it no <laughs> <laughs> uh, so now we're gonna finally close off uh, with a question that ties a bit of all the things that we, we spoke already. Uh, and that question is destined to Sabrina. So in more general terms and under the light of the climate crisis, you have argued for a need of a profound civilizational change to address urgent climate related matters, such as the decarbonization of economies and the decommodification of natural resources. Your suggested alternative is developed under tradition of equal socialism. Could you please explain us the main concepts behind this idea and its relevance for the construction of a post-COVID scenario? Well, the, the first thing for us to realize is that uh, even for those who are working towards eco-socialism, it's not going to happen right after the pandemic. This is a really uh, long-term <laughs> long project, uh, but there are a few things that uh, are important that we can implement nowadays that kind of pave the way uh, for something more sustainable and something that actually challenges capitalism at the core to come right after that. Uh, Eco-socialism is a perspective, a socialist perspective, a Marxist perspective that deals with the understanding that there is no way that capitalism can actually uh, lead us to keep surviving on this planet at this rate of uh, crazy accumulation rate. Uh, but also that productivist socialism, especially with this, with its authoritarian traits, is also not the way. Um, the understanding behind eco socialism is that the ecology uh, standpoint should be at the core of how we want to change society. We might want to have a society that distributes resources better, that people have great greater quality of living. But if nature is destroyed, this is just not going to be possible. We're not going to be possible to even start claiming the notion of abundance back. Uh, so people can have an abundant life. That doesn't mean necessarily having a lot of trinkets at home, as capitalism tells us so. So um, behind eco-socialism is this idea that we need to also re reclaim the knowledge and uh, bring to the front the leadership of indigenous communities, of the most marginalized peoples that have uh, borne the, the, 
the bunt of all of this situation, actually, right? So when it comes to colonization, this is still a matter in many parts of the world. We're talking about settler colonialism. We're talking about the patterns of racism that also translate into environmental racism. Uh, so these voices need to be heard because they're the most impacted, but they currently have no economic power to actually, uh, to actually put forward this change themselves. So the anti-capitalist perspective is right there at the beginning. But the hopes is that, for example, if we're talking about transitioning ecologically, uh, talking about decarbonization within this decade and the next, next decade, um, it is quite clear that there's not going to be a worldwide revolution during these decades, especially when the, the right and the far right, uh, they're still doing quite well. But it is possible to push for certain non-reformist reforms uh, such as agrarian reform, uh, some reforms that would prevent further commoditization of nature. And with this, uh, we, could, we can start challenging other things and organizing more and more people towards something more radical for the future. Uh, this is called the civilizational change, mostly because we're trying to oppose this idea that socialism is just about changing the ownership of the means of production. So you have the means of production and they're currently privatized. So then you just change it into something uh, that, well, the workers will take benefit of that, but then you keep producing at an alarming rate. You keep destroying nature and mining to produce more and more trinkets and you associate uh, economic growth the way that capitalism has taught us, us the economic growth is you associate that with progress and development. So we're, we, we say it's a civilizational change because we need to change not just one paradigm, but multiple paradigms to make sure that life on earth can be preserved in a way that also lead us to like fulfill our, our most basic wants and needs and actually have a good life. And rescuing here the concept with, of Sumakase, uh, Ben Vivir from, from the Andino communities, indigenous communities in South America. Wonderful. Okay, uh, so thank you very much for this final answer. I think it was a good way for us to finish this debate uh, on uh, environmental issues of the International Research Group on Authoritarianisms and Counter Strategies. It was a great, great pleasure uh, talking to the three of you. I'm very happy to have been able to do this. And uh, I would say that we could close off the session for today unless uh, there is anything to add from your part. No, 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 no. Okay, cool. So uh, thanks, uh, everyone. Uh, thanks for those of you who are watching now. And uh, don't forget to like and subscribe to the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation channel. And um, we'll see each other soon. Thank you. Thank you.